Gentlemen, we all know that it is of paramount importance that you spend quality time gaming with the homies on the weekends, that you make time for the boys. But when is the last time you spent quality time with the boys, you know? your boys. Because much like a rich friendship, your personal hygiene cannot be neglected. Fortunately for you, the Performance Package 4.0 by Manscaped has everything you need to give your hygiene a major buff. The Lawnmower 4.0 comes with skin safe technology to help prevent nicks and cuts, a built in LED so that you can see what you're doing, and it's also cordless and waterproof so you can comfortably use it in the shower. You heard that right, Smash players. If you're like me, you sweat a lot when gaming, especially this time of year, and luckily also in included in the performance package are the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and the Crop Reviver Ball Toner Spray to keep your particulars feeling fresh. The Performance Package 4.0 also comes with the Weed Whacker Nose Plus Ear Hair Trimmer as well as not one, but two free gifts. The Manscaped Anti-Chafing Boxer Briefs and the Shed Travel Bag to keep it all in one place for you. If you're ready to buff your hygiene, don't miss out on 20% off plus free shipping when you use the promo code Daryl at Manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code Daryl at manscaped.com. Thanks again to Manscaped for sponsoring, and without further ado, onto the show. Hi there. Let's take a trip down memory lane. Can you think back to a time when, as a child, you were told no? Can you think of a time where maybe you wanted to stay at past 10 on a school night, when you thought M&Ms were a perfectly fine meal substitute for your mom's meatloaf, when you felt as though keeping this stray dog was a no-brainer, and your mom and pa hit you with the stern, absolutely not. In those moments, most of us feel a deep guttural sickness, a form of rage and adolescent angst that we have all come to know as rebellion. Because inevitably, you'd pop out that DS at around 10.30 under the covers when your parents thought you were asleep, you'd sneak some M&Ms out of the pantry when your dad was wrapped up watching the dolphins, and you've adopted five dogs in college because no one can stop you now. Being told no is an unpleasant experience, especially when that no is dictating what we can and cannot do. And what's fascinating about this primal rebellious feeling is that it has a direct effect on how we view and play games, most notably the open world game. You see, my dear friends, it's not just clickbait, it's not just a hot take, I have genuine scientific reason to believe that games like these are not what you think they are. You don't actually want open world games, at least for the reasons you think you do. Because while I acknowledge there are a lot of reasons someone might want an open world game, the views, the exploration, the world building, the environmental storytelling, the scale, the sensation of feeling small in the universe, an excuse to ride a horse, a chance to turn up the HUD, refuse fast travel, and just get lost. I also know that that freedom comes at a cost. And no, it's not that exploring the big world doesn't fit the pace and urgency of the story, it's not ludo narrative dissonance, it's not that open worlds are hard to fully fill with unique content, that the difficulty curve is warped, or that sometimes it feels like the market is a bit oversaturated with them, it's that what you want from them is not actually what you think they'll give you, it's what you think they won't give you. I promise this will make sense in a moment. Welcome to the show. In an old 1974 study, psychologists presented college students with a set of three attractive items, cologne, cash, and course credit, meaning they could get out of participating in a future study, so we'll call it time. Each student ranked these three items on how attractive they found them. If it was me, I'm probably going time, then cash, then cologne. You might choose differently, but regardless, after each student made those rankings, they would be told one of three things. One group of students was told that they would receive their highest ranked item, lucky them. The second group was told that they would be randomly assigned one of the items to keep, and the third group was told that they would receive their choice of any of the three items, regardless of how they ranked them. However, a little later on when it came time to cash out on those items, what actually happened was that all three groups, no matter what they were promised, received one of the three items at random. Now, as you can imagine, some participants were a little angry, and this is what the researchers were counting on and what they intended to study. If you were just told you'd get your most attractive item, the cash, and then instead got cologne, of course you'd be upset. But what the researchers did not count on was that the group that was most upset was not the one told they would get their number one item, it was the group that was told that they would get to choose. It wasn't the loss of the item that frustrated the students the most, it was the loss of freedom. 
This was even true when the students told they would have a choice actually happened to still receive their highest ranked item. Even if they ended up getting the item they most desired, they still became upset because they wanted the option to decide for themselves. This frustration is the same guttural feeling we had as kids and even as adults. That rebellious, you can't tell me what to do, and subsequent doing of said thing simply out of spite. It's a phenomenon known as reactance, an unpleasant motivational arousal that emerges when people experience a threat to or loss of their free behaviors. It serves as a motivator to restore one's freedom. And this paper is one of the first of many over the years to find results like this. A handful of studies have found that people whose choices are restricted like this usually feel uncomfortable, hostile, aggressive, and angry. Based on what I posted recently, yeah, I think it's fair to say that we generally dislike whenever games do this. Other research shows that freedom-threatened people may simply exhibit the restricted behavior anyways, or observe others performing a related behavior. Have you ever tried to brute force a boss or a level despite the game wanting you to do it the intended way? Have you ever found yourself watching someone do a run of a game that would make the devs go, No. <laughs> this isn't how you're supposed to play the game. Some folks may aggressively force the threatening person to remove the threat to free choice, or they may behave in a hostile and aggressive way just to let off steam. You ever wonder why people get so damn upset that Pokemon doesn't look like this? It's not just graphics. One of the biggest complaints I got from you guys was how handholdy and linear some of the old Pokemon games are. And this is all stuff I'm sure you've considered before, but maybe didn't have a name for. We generally don't like when games take away our choices, and that is thanks to reactants. Which brings me to open world games and their mistaken allure. <laughs> if you like open world games, this is not me shitting on them. I like them too. Again, when done right, we all know how special they can be. There was a lot that they can provide for you, but what I'm really talking about here is a misconception. Namely, something we generally think open world games don't provide, reactants. One of the biggest things open worlds offer the player is freedom, right? Go anywhere, do anything, backtrack, wander into dangerous areas, get your ass kicked and come back later for some crazy perspective on your growth. What we're after when we pick these games up by absolute nature is the openness of the end game world. If you don't believe me, it's literally the genre name that is fundamentally a large part of the appeal. We crave these games on the surface because we are confident picking them up that we won't feel that uneasy simmering reactance when a game bosses us around too much. Because it won't. Open world games are not supposed to tell you no, and if they were to, we would become irritated, right? Overwhelming enemy force? Bullshit, son. Let me try anyway. Alright, let me see if I can take a little shortcut here. Thanks, Rockstar. Ah, look, an invisible wall, just like the ones back home. Uh, I, I didn't want to trigger this yet. Okay, I guess I'm just doing this now. Uh, oh, 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 oh no. Oh, oh good, I'm trapped here now. What do you mean I can't pet the turtle? These are just a few examples of moments where the game, for whatever reason, maybe good, maybe bad, takes your freedom as a player away from you. And as we have discussed, this is when good old reactance comes into play. Now we are a little upset, or at the very least, kind of like, uh. And we're less motivated to play the game for the sake of playing the game, and more motivated to restore that lost freedom, to tell the game, you can't tell me what to do. Which leads to brute forcing, hurrying through plot to get back to where you can do what you actually wanted to be doing, or simply moving on to another game that you hope won't make you feel like this. Oh, and by the way, in case it wasn't clear, all the examples I just used are from open world games. Which is fine, these things don't bother everyone that plays them. In fact, under the right circumstances, reactants might make your time with the game better, which we'll come back to. But one reason I think so many people do get irritated by these moments is because a huge allure of this genre, whether we're conscious of it or not, is that we assume that it comes without the threat of reactants. However, in many cases, it does. I'll say it again. You don't actually want open world games. You want the freedom you think they provide. 
And listen, of course open world games actually do provide a lot of freedom. These are only specific moments in them. Not to mention, I don't think games creating reactants is a bad thing per se. I think most people would argue that games should restrict the player at least to some degree so that we aren't completely overwhelmed by the sheer quantity of options and side missions and world building and easter eggs and alternative endings and dialogues and so on. We've talked a lot about how the game restricting our options creates reactants, what we would more specifically call external reactants. But we haven't talked about the other source of this feeling. If you've ever felt yourself frozen at what to do next in an open world game, and then sort of just eventually walked away from it, you've probably experienced internal reactants. In this study, participants experienced choice overload when offered an extensive array of 24 or 30 alternative products instead of a limited set of six options. The high number of choices was demotivating, and even though participants liked having an extensive number of choices more than a limited number, paradoxically, they were less likely to purchase a hypothetical product in the study. And interestingly, participants reported more subsequent satisfaction with their selections when their original set of options had been limited. Even though we initially much prefer to have more options, it seems that we are actually happier when the choice is a bit easier for us. The reason for this is pretty complex and a bit beyond the scope of this video, but to sum it up, research seems to suggest that if you have a choice between two attractive alternatives, as you try and decide between them, you'll feel reactants simply from having to commit to one of them. By saying yes to Totodile, you're saying no to Chikorita and Cyndaquil, which, based on how reactance works, makes you kind of want the other two more. As soon as you commit to a choice, the other options become unavailable and therefore more interesting. You might feel uneasy that you missed out on them, so when you multiply this effect by 30 side quests, 14 landmarks, 4 unexplored vistas, 2 towers, and a horse stable so far, of course you'll feel a big pang of reactance for how you spend your time. If an open world game is too open, if it offers too much freedom, it'll actually cause the exact reactants you were hoping to avoid by picking it up in the first place. I'll say it one last time, you don't actually want open world games, you want the freedom you think they provide. So, how do you strike the balance? How do great games, not just open world games, find just the right amount of freedom without over or under restricting you? Well, having done research for this video, I can confidently say that that's an answer you can find on a better channel. But you can see how reactance plays into clever design choices that nudge you in the right direction instead of forcing you into it. One of those better channels, namely Adam Milliard, made a great point about how Breath of the Wild doesn't force you to go to the water dungeon first, but most people do because of how the world is designed. Guardians to the north, water to the south, and harsh desert heat to the west means most players will comfortably head east, which is right where the devs would probably like you to start your journey, and yet, I never hear a peep of complaints about Breath of the Wild stepping on the player's freedom. I've never played, but Fallout New Vegas apparently does something similar. Metroid Dread, which I have played, I thought did a great job of this as well. It would keep you from backtracking too much by selectively trapping you on certain large chunks of the map where you needed to be. You still have plenty to explore, but it kept you from getting too far off track, almost sort of suggesting that you stay in this area uh, just because you might find something interesting. And by the same token, it kept you feeling lost by warping you all over the map, but subtly dropping you off really close to where you needed to be to progress the game. Compare that to objective markers and dotted lines that just tell you what you should do, and you can see why the former examples here are world designs that people generally praise. It's sort of like this one time at a water park, I was in line to ride the highest slide in the park. The lifeguard was telling people to slide with their legs crossed for safety reasons. I took that personally and just assumed it was to keep you from going too fast. So when I didn't cross my legs and several hundred gallons of water was sent rocketing up my gooch and I came up the water slide looking like this, I wish I had listened and now I always cross my legs on water slides. And as odd as it sounds, I think that's really the core of this entire discussion. We don't like to be told. We like to figure it out ourselves. 
We don't want to be told we can't have M&Ms for dinner. We want to throw the meatloaf in Boston Harbor because you can't take away my freedom, mom. If I get a stomach ache, I get a stomach ache. We don't want to be grounded from trying to fight an enemy because the game thinks we aren't strong enough yet. We want to fuck around and find out. Developers make the decisions they make for our own good. The intentions are always pure, much like a parent. But if you tell us not to run by the pool, it's just going to make running by the pool even more enticing. You may as well let us slip and bust our ass and learn for ourselves, right? But, but also, maybe don't do that with your real kids. Concussions are serious business. In games, however, I think reactance suggests that most people would rather consequences instead of restriction. But obviously, some restriction is still necessary to keep that player in the happy place between being told and being completely on their own. In the final stretch of this video, I want to branch out from just open world games and maybe talk about times where reactants may actually be intended and can even enhance the experience. One of the most annoying sections in a game for me as a kid was the Forsaken Fortress in Zelda Wind Waker, where you lose your sword and have to sneak around without getting caught to get it back. Of course, it was frustrating to lose the option to fight, especially after just getting it, but that was also the point. Reactance is a motivator. We want to restore that lost freedom, so eventually getting that sword back felt all the more rewarding because of that reactance. The same can be said of Chapter 5 in Red Dead 2, which another one of those better channels, Rasputin, made a great point about. You're stuck in kind of a linear part of the story with no way to get back to your usual routine in the game, and that loss of freedom actually serves as such a good motivator that it refreshed his experience with the game and made the world he returned to much more interesting. As soon as it was taken away, it became more appealing. Reactance aside, we all know that restricting players' freedoms can jumpstart the gameplay in other ways. In Mario Sunshine, those sections you have to do without Flood forces you to approach them differently, and even Tide Island in Breath of the Wild where you lose all your gear and start from scratch was fun for the same reasons. Remember these teleporty chests in Elden Ring that drop you in a super hostile part of the map? Sneaking out back to safety was a hell of a ride and an organic change of pace. One example that I think really plays into its story nicely is in a game called Unpacking, where, you guessed it, you simply unpack someone's stuff into rooms throughout their life. Small, subtle spoiler, but as you unpack one picture in particular and try to put it on a clipboard, you'll find that you actually can't. The game won't let you for some reason. It has to go somewhere out of sight. Just a super clever way to communicate that our silent main character here really doesn't want to see that person's face anymore. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that plot twist in Bioshock. If you know, you know. Well, to put a neat little bow on this, I'll simply say that we don't like to be told no, especially when it's this little shit ruining our social life. And much to our parents and to developers' dismay, telling someone not to do something usually causes them to only want to do that thing more and almost always causes at least a tinge of negative emotion. Open world games on the surface look to be the cure for this, but as we've seen, this is not always the case. And in fact, sometimes, for our own good, we need to be told no. The secret sauce that makes any game, not just open world games, operate around our reactants comfortably is to suggest, encourage, and provide learning opportunities instead of simply saying you can't. Because when left with too much or not enough freedom, well, I think you know the rest. Hello, you delicious baked potato. Thank you for being you and for watching this video. I'll be perfectly honest, I was not in the mood to make a video this month. It's hot, I'm tired, I can't stop playing Neon White, and I just want to do anything other than write. But oddly, I'm, I'm pretty happy with how this turned out. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know down below a time when you definitely felt reactance in a game, and maybe how it improved or tarnished your experience. As always, I can't thank my tremendous Patreon family enough for supporting the show, and I'd like to send a special shout out to this month's featured patrons Josiah White, Billy120745, Reinhard Grassman, Sasquatch, which I like to think is like the Sasquatch watching the channel, Colt King, Black Sharks, Daniel Ruh, and David Holmgren. 
If you'd like to see your name on screen like you see here, click that orange link. Thanks again for watching. Like, share, subscribe, and please have yourself a damn good one.